Welcome to True Crime Review, an unflinching gaze into the depths of human depravity. The podcast covers current crime news, updates on cold cases and resources for research and investigation. True Crime Review often discusses disturbing and violent crimes. So listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to episode 13 of True Crime Review. It has been too long in the making, I know, and at least a couple of people have asked about it. It is finally here and we should be back on schedule every couple of weeks after what was an unexpected hiatus of sorts in the past month, a month and a half. I'm going to start off talking briefly about the Patreon, and the Patreon can be found at patreon.com slash truecrimereview, and I want to send out a huge thank you to our first three Patreon patrons who are Leo, Jan, and Deborah, for their generous patronage. I'm already working on the first Patreon-exclusive episode, which is one of the reasons that episode 13 has come out late. And you can get all of the Patreon-exclusive episodes for just the baseline $1 per month subscription. So... Again, go to patreon.com slash true crime review if you're considering patronage and just have a look at all the other rewards. I do want to report that I said I'd do a dance after my first patron, and I did do the dance. However, I decided it was in the best interest of all of us that there's going to be no video or GIF of the dance. I'm just I'm telling you what happened and you're just going to have to trust me. Moving on just briefly, I'm going to try and bring these down a little bit. I've been reading a lot of the reviews, especially the five-star reviews, and that's because they're hugely appreciated. But I'm trying to tighten up the show a little bit, so I'm just going to do some shout-outs, some thank-yous. So I've had a bunch of five-star iTunes reviews since episode 12. And I just want to send some shout-outs to Jennabug, Jennabug, Lanel, or Ianel. I actually can't tell if that's capital L or capital I. A lowercase L or capital I. Foggy Star, Natty9917, and Liss Lucy. As I'm sure every podcaster you listen to tells you five-star reviews are hugely helpful in getting the show more exposure getting it up on the charts so if you think that it deserves a five-star review i hope that you'll consider giving true crime review one of those on itunes i'm going to roll right into the podcast recommendation and this episode's recommendation is very special to me because I lived in Philadelphia for about 12 years give or take a year or two and this time the recommendation is Twisted Philly and Twisted Philly is a podcast by Philly area native Deanna Marie and it's quote about mischief and mayhem in the city of brotherly love Now, the show isn't exclusively about true crime, but it's featured often enough that it's easily among my favorite true crime podcasts already. As I said, having lived in Philly myself for about 12 years probably doesn't hurt, but it's safe to say based on the quality of the show and its quick growth that you don't have to be from the area to really enjoy Deanna Marie's uh, hard work. And last, uh, lastly, I just want to point out, Twisted Philly has been keeping a very close eye on the awful rape and murder of 14-year-old Grace Packer in the Philadelphia suburb of Abington. 
And in a series called For the Love of Gracie, Deanna Marie is going to cover the life and the death of Gracie with a focus on remembering the girl for who she was and, and not just you know, how she died. So maybe Twisted Philly was such an instant hit with me because it is the same focus as I try to have uh, with this podcast, and that's the victims. So I expect For the Love of Gracie will be one of the best examples of how important that focus really is, and I look forward to listening to Twisted Philly with every new episode. You can find more information about it at twistedphilly.com or just search for Twisted Philly on your favorite uh, podcast app or directory. Now we're going to go to the news. Now, the story of Grace Packer, as I just mentioned in the podcast recommendation, is uh, is a sad one and a, a tragic one. It's it's also sadly reminiscent of the deaths of both Victoria Martins and Erica Parsons. Two girls I discussed in episodes four and six. In episode four, I covered how Victoria's mother was involved in her rape and murder. And in episode six, I covered how Erica's adoptive parents abused her for most of her life with them, including coercing her adoptive brother to assist them with that abuse. That brother reported Erica missing in 2013, two years after he last saw her. And her adopted parents went to prison in 2014 for continuing to collect benefits in her name long after she disappeared. Now, Grace Packer's story is, again, it's a really awful combination of these two stories. Despite the general warning at the beginning of the episode, I do feel obligated to give you another warning right here. This is a disturbing and a violent story that we're about to give you an update on from the Delaware County Daily News. That paper quote says, quote, Police have said that as part of a horrific rape murder fantasy plot carried out in July, Sarah Packer watched as her boyfriend, 44-year-old Jacob Sullivan, beat and raped Grace, who was then bound, gagged, and left to die in the sweltering attic of their Quaker town home. Returning in the next day and finding Grace still alive, Sullivan suffocated her, according to investigators. The couple then packed Grace's body in cat litter to mask any odors and stored her in the attic for months, then dismembered her and dumped the body parts in a remote area of upstate Pennsylvania, where hunters found her on Halloween, police said. Unquote. Sarah Packer's boyfriend has since confessed and charges for the murder and for the benefits fraud, which again is similar to Erica Parsons, uh, have both been brought. So both murder and fraud charges. Sarah Packer waived her preliminary hearing, which procedurally means she's one step closer to trial. And I wouldn't be surprised if the waiver is a precursor to a plea deal. Uh, there's no word on a deal yet. So that's just speculation on my part, but uh, it's something I expect we'll see in the next few months. You can find more coverage at the links that I'll share in the show notes on that case. Next news story is about the what's called the Bear Brook Murders. The Bear Brook Murders, also referred to as the Allentown, Allentown Four, are four unidentified female murder victims discovered in 1985 and 2000 at Bear Brook State Park in Allentown, New Hampshire. The case had never been solved until January 2017. This is from Wik uh, Wikipedia, by the way. All the victims were either partially or completely skeletonized. They're believed to have died between 1977 and 1985. The victims' faces have been reconstructed multiple times, most recently by the, Na the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children.
In 2017, the father of the middle child was identified as Robert Bob Evans, who is believed to be responsible for these murders as well as several others, including the disappearance of his girlfriend in 1981. He was convicted of a different murder and eventually died in prison in 2010. Again, that's the end of the quote from Wikipedia. This case is is notable and worth um, providing this news update on because the adult female and the young girl with her were found in a metal drum in 1985, so the first discovery uh, in this case. And the other two young girls were not actually found until the year 2000, and then only by accident during a follow-up investigation performed by a detective that had been newly assigned to the, to the cold case. The adult woman and two of the girls are related, but the victim, who was the child of the suspect Robert Evans, whose real name I think is Curtis Kimball, he has a long list of aliases. The adult woman and two of the girls are related, but the victim, who was the child of Robert Evans, who's actually an alias for Curtis Kimball, is not related to the other three victims. And while authorities are confident that Robert Evans committed these murders, they still cannot and have not identified the victims. You can actually see the references section of the Wikipedia article if you want to look deeper into this case. And there's also an extensive thread on the WebSleuth forum I'll share a link to and an excellent article about how they found out that three of the four victims were actually Related, and one of them was Evans' child. In uh, you can find that article in Forensic Magazine. I'll also, uh, put a link to that in the show notes. Next story is about Joanne Vial. I hope I'm not pronouncing her name wrong, but it's spelled V I A U. That's actually Joan, I'm sorry, Joan Vial. 52-year-old Williamsbridge, New York resident Joanne Vial was reported missing on January 23, 2017. She was last seen alive on her way to a veteran affairs hospital with a 31-year-old son, Joseph Garcia. Her boyfriend found her car near her home shortly after with bloodstains in it. Her body was found six days later, and her son was arrested after being caught on video moving her car and trying to use her ATM card. He's being held on $100,000 bail, and while authorities haven't announced it yet, I suspect we're going to see them add homicide charges shortly. While no obvious motive has been reported, my gut says that uh, mental illness probably played a big role in this case. Our next story is Jessica Runyon's, and this is an update. I covered the September 2016 disappearance of Jessica Runyon's in episode four. A man named Kyler Eust was charged with burning Jessica's vehicle. Eust had been dating a girl named Kara Kapetsky on and off when she disappeared about nine years ago. And while it looked like he was a suspect in that disappearance, he was never actually charged. And Kara, or her body, assuming she's been murdered, have never been found. Now, Jessica's family has been searching for her since September when she went missing. And while they haven't found her, what they have found is two unrelated bodies. So the first was identified as Brandon Herring, missing since November 2016, and the subject of an ongoing homicide investigation. His mother, Rhonda, told a local television news reporter, quote, Now I have my baby, I have a little closure, unquote. The second decedent found near the end of January 2017 has yet to be identified, but is currently labeled a suspicious death. Jessica Runyon's father, John, was happy to provide Rhonda Herring with that closure, she mentioned, but he and the many family and friends helping him will continue their search for Jessica.
Next story is Zuzu Verk. 21-year-old Texas college student Zuzu Verk was reported missing on October 12, 2016 and later found dead, prompting an investigation which led to the arrest of her boyfriend and his friend, both of whom are currently charged with second-degree felony evidence tampering by concealment of a corpse. The investigation is ongoing and evidence is mounting, as you can read in a recent NBCNews.com article I'll be sure to include in the show notes. Lori Verk, Zuzu's mother, told a CBS affiliate she is eager for justice. Quote, we'll lay her to rest and then, then we can go after the consequences that need to be met. How dare anyone do this? Unquote. That woman sounds so strong to me. She's recently recovered her murder daughter's remains, and yet she's and she's no doubt in mourning. But she still harbors an outspoken demand for justice and quote the consequences that need to be met. So I, I really hope homicide charges are added to Zuzu's boyfriend's charge sheet very soon. So her family, after burying her, can move ahead with getting that very justice that that her mother is clearly so focused on getting for Zuzu. Our next story is Karina Vetrano. 30-year-old Karina Vetrano was jogging near her Queens, New York home on August 2nd, 2016, when she was uh, sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Now, tragically, this is heartbreaking. She usually jogged with her father, but he had not felt well that day, so she decided to jog alone. And when she was gone too long, Phil Vetrano went looking for his daughter, and unfortunately, he was actually the one that found her dead. Now, Phil began pushing for New York State to authorize the use of something called familial DNA in investigations. Familial DNA can identify the relatives of a suspect, helping authorities build or narrow a list of suspects. And while it's still under review in New York, with a bill authorizing its use moving through the state legislature, DNA found under Karina's fingernails on her back and on her cell phone was tested using standard methods. And in conjunction with a review of 911 calls from that night, led authorities to arrest 20-year-old suspect Chanel Lewis. So... DNA is not bulletproof. Uh, anybody that's paying attention to forensic developments or just recent court cases will probably have noticed that there is a creeping sense in the scientific community and the legal community that DNA is not the be-all, end-all of, of identification, es- especially when it is the only evidence, physical evidence in a case. Uh, There are instances of mistakes, there are instances of tampering, there are instances of just accidentally um, transferring DNA from one place to another, from one person to another. So, you know, why those are issues to keep in mind, it sounds like this is going to be a very strong case against Mr. Lewis, and hopefully Mr. Vetrano will get the justice that Karina deserves. And at the same time, though, hopefully the familial DNA bill will eventually pass. And someday on a future episode, I'll I'll read up on it and we'll talk more about it. But but being able to put that list together of uh, potential suspects is, you know, could be tremendously useful in developing leads in a case where otherwise there might be no leads. So, and it sounds from what I've read that like Phil Vetrano is still going to be uh, advocating for that. So I think that that's a, uh, that's a good thing. Next story is an update on Erica Parsons. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Erica Parsons was abused by her family chronically for much of her life, her adoptive family abused her, and and I covered her in several prior episodes. Uh, she was 
buried after a funeral on February 25th, 2017, the day after her birthday. In late 2016, her adoptive father led authorities to the shallow grave he admitted burying her in, but no one, for some reason, has yet been charged for her murder. The investigation, according to police, is ongoing, but I predict we'll see charges against Eric's adoptive parents. They continued collecting benefits uh, for her, even after her disappearance sometime in 2017, and they're both in jail for that. Uh, my gut on this says that their abuse one day went too far and ended up being fatal in what was maybe not necessarily intended to be a murder, although we could certainly call it a murder. Um, I suspect that they essentially abused this poor girl to death. So I hope that, again, we see charges very soon. And our last news story is just going to be a very brief uh, notification to our listeners that there was an arrest made in the 2005 disappearance of Tara Grinstead, a former student of the school at which she taught had been arrested in connection with the 2005 disappearance uh, sometime last week. Uh, a man named Payne Lindsay does a great podcast called Up and Vanished, and it has been the canonical source of info for the Tara Grinstead case since the podcast began. And uh, Payne Lindsay does a great deal of his own investigation over the course of the podcast and has been following it very closely and doing, I think, really a tremendous job. Uh, you can find more from him at upandvanished.com, and he'll be following the rest and the recent developments that are sure to follow uh, very closely. So again, upandvanished.com. And this next segment is a little controversial. Some people think it's stupid, or at least the name is stupid. It's the human garbage of the week. It's not going anywhere. You might call it a, a guilty pleasure. Uh, for your host here. Um, some people, based on the things that they're willing to do to other people, are garbage. They're trash. They're refuse. And they should be disposed of <laughs> as such. Uh, we're going to keep calling them Human Garbage of the Week. And we're going to keep picking them. So, we've actually already mentioned this episode's Human Garbage uh, a little bit earlier. And it's Sarah Packer who helped her boyfriend rape her own adopted daughter before the two bound her, gagged her, and left her in a hot attic to die. They strangled her when they found out she was still alive days later, and Sarah Packer herself later bought a bow saw and blades at a hardware store, which she undoubtedly used to dismember her daughter, whose body was later found in pieces. Now, the kicker here is that Sarah Packer was at one point a supervisor at Northampton County's Children, Youth, and Families Division. She was entrusted with the care and safety not only of her own foster and adopted children, but of all endangered children in her county. She is, to put it mildly, disgusting in every way. Somebody can be disgusting. But let me just be clear. Monsters like Sarah Packer are not representative of child welfare workers who, despite being frequently painted as baby snatchers, tirelessly pursue the safety and welfare of the children and families they serve and are often criminally underpaid and overworked in return for that dedication. So I don't want... I've seen already some news articles, some interviews, some blog posts that are sort of painting this as Sarah Packer is somehow representative of, you know, the worst extreme of this baby snatching group of people that nobody, you know, nobody really trusts. These people are overwhelmingly, incredibly hardworking, incredibly empathetic, and 
and again, just criminally underappreciated. So I really need you to keep that in mind. Resource for this episode is a bit unlike the prior resources that I have recommended to you, and it is Unsolved Mysteries, which is now currently streaming on Amazon. And I am not talking about the abomination that was done many years later with a different host that I never watched and probably won't ever watch. I am talking about Unsolved Mysteries with Robert the Man Stack. The first two seasons are available right now, and they include updates to many of the segments that were actually done very much in the style of the show. So where there is an update that was added recently that, you know, the graphics are much the same, the B-roll, the photos, all that stuff, very similar, and they just sort of use a text overlay to give you the, the new information. So really cool. Now, true crime fans will undoubtedly recognize some of the cases the show covered, and while the updates are often fascinating, it's the cases that remain cold that are the most intriguing to me. So, whether you want some nostalgia for the 90s or just looking for a new but old mystery to research, Unsolved Mysteries on Amazon is a great watch. And I just want to mention here that the link on the website Two Unsolved Mysteries will be an Amazon affiliate link, which just means everything you buy on Amazon after you click it will toss a few pennies my way. won't cost you anything extra, so you pay the same exact prices, but get to support the show effectively for free. Oh, and hopefully, very soon, I will have a surprise that has something to do with Unsolved Mysteries. And there are a couple of people out there who, if they are listening, will know exactly what I'm talking about because it will involve them, and it should be very cool, and stay tuned. Now on to our cold case. Our cold case for episode 13 is the disappearance of Joanne Gladys Gar. As usual, much of the info I found on this case comes from the Charlie Project. Joanne Gladys Gar was born on December 1st, 1940. When she went missing in 1971, that's right, 1971, she was 5 feet and 3 inches tall, and weighed 110 to 130 pounds. She was white with red hair and blue eyes and freckles on her face, arms, and legs. She sometimes went by Joan. So I may call her Joan or Joanne throughout throughout this segment that those both refer to, to Joanne Gladys Gar. Now, she was last seen in Dearborn Heights, Michigan on November 24th, 1971. She wasn't reported missing until December 31st, and I'll I'll explain why shortly. She had married her second husband, Philip Gar, less than one year before she went missing. He said she had returned to their house after being estranged from him for a while, packed her bags, and then left him once again. However, he couldn't provide a date on which he last saw her and claimed he didn't have any idea where she may have gone. Now, Joanne's first husband, Robert Ross, spoke to her by phone on November 24th, 1971. So the two could arrange Joanne's November 26th, November 25th pickup of the divorced couple's children. Joanne intended to take them to a parade in Detroit for Thanksgiving. However, she never showed up at Robert's to pick up her children. And she also failed to appear for Thanksgiving dinner, to which a female friend of hers had invited her.
After November 24th, no one at her employer, High Grade Food Products Corporation in Southfield, Michigan, ever saw her again. She had worked there for six years when she vanished, but when she stopped showing up for work, for some reason I can't really fathom, the company assumed that she had quit. Why? I don't know. She's been there six years, presumably very reliable. Doesn't show up for a while, and you assume she quit? Weird to me. They mailed her belongings to the house she had shared with Philip Gar, but, and this really got my attention, the box came back to high grade as undelivered. And they later, again, for some reason I can't understand, just threw all the stuff away. Uh, A lot of opportunities there in my mind for her employer to see some red flags, especially she's been there for six years. She must have at least a friend or two that she works with, Uh, but apparently nobody thought any of this was strange. So Joanne's mom, Dolores Lesninski, called her husband, called Joanne's husband, Philip, in late December of 71 because she hadn't heard from her daughter in a while. It would have been a few weeks at this point. And again, Philip's first story was that Joanne was in Ohio visiting a friend. But, and, and this is a direct quote from the Charlie Project, put it very well. Quote, when this statement proved false, he said she was in Illinois. And finally, as I said earlier, his final story was that she had packed her bags and left him and that she had been picked up by a man that Philip didn't know. There had previously been visible injuries on Joanne, like black eyes and bruises, which her mother and others had seen and which both Joanne and Philip explained away as accidents. It isn't clear whether anyone believed these explanations, and it doesn't sound like they should have. Dolores reported Joanne missing on December 31st, 1971, and by August 24th, 1972, Detroit policewoman Judith Larson wrote a letter, and the, the letter will be in the show notes, to the distraught mother informing her that the case was being, quote, placed in the closed pending file, unquote, because all leads had effectively been exhausted. So the letter essentially shifted any responsibility for further investigation on Dolores, saying, quote, If at any time you receive information which would warrant further investigation, please contact us immediately so that the case may be reactivated. So, ever since 1972, about 45 years ago, the case has been ice cold. Now, there's not much in the way of modern information on this case. Um, There was some coverage when she first disappeared, but there has not been really any update. Now, to me, reading... The Charlie Project entry and some of the other sources I've found, I'll have links to everything in the show notes. It seems to me hard to imagine that Philip Gar didn't murder Joanne Gladys Gar. It's just hard to believe. Um, you know, there are indications, circumstantial, yes, but indications of domestic violence. Okay. Uh, they were only married a very short time. Okay, I don't know how long they knew each other before they got married, um, but they were only married a short time. There were signs of physical abuse. The The guy couldn't get his story straight. He told three different stories that we know of. Um, you know, who knows if there's, there's more stories from him that, you know, the police have held on to his holdbacks, which are just when police don't release all the information pertaining to a case so they have something to test a a would-be confessor with. Um, I don't know. It seems like he, Philip, was essentially trying to put Joanne everywhere he could to get her away from him as far as his his three different stories. We're just going to go over them one more time because it's just so ridiculous to me. 
His first story that he told to Joanne's mom, Dolores, was that Joanne was in Ohio visiting a friend. The Charlie Project interestingly says, when this statement proved false, he said she was in Illinois. So my thought on that is that perhaps he named a friend or there was a friend that Joanne's mom knew Joanne had in Ohio and they checked up, they followed up with that friend and discovered, you know, she hadn't seen Joanne in in months or who knows how long. So that proved false. So somehow they figured out that was false. And then he says, oh, oh, never mind. No, never mind. She's in Illinois. Okay. We don't know what happens between the Illinois story and the final story. But eventually the final story does come. And he says that Joanne packed her bags and left him and was picked up by a man he didn't know. Now, all three of these stories, there may be more detail we don't have. But going on what we have, they are so vague and so, you know, unconfirmable. He probably didn't even expect they were going to be able to prove the Ohio story, story number one, false, when he actually, when he told it to them. So then the other two are even more vague. You know, story two, she's in Illinois. Well, that's a state. Like, a, a whole state. That doesn't help anything. Who's she with? She's not going to tell you she's going to Illinois, full stop. And then she left with a man she didn't know is the final story. And that one is especially convenient for Philip because what could a man that Philip didn't know do? Well, he could have murdered her. Maybe he murdered her. I'm not buying it. I'm going to give you my frank opinion of Philip Gar. I think he's full of shit. Um, I haven't found much about him. Uh, so I don't know if he comes off better in, you know, in audio or video interviews or in person. Maybe he's a trustworthy guy and I'm giving him a, a bad rap. I don't know, but it sounds really fishy. And, you know, on his side, in his defense of sorts, couldn't really find any other suspects um, that I could name. So in the absence of other suspects, and I have a guy here that's really jumping off the page at me, that's my theory. Um, I've actually reached out to a few people, I'm just going to say people for now, who I think know more about this case. They may know more than, than what I told you, but at the very least, they they know the things that I've told you in a more direct way, is all I'll say. And I haven't really heard back, but I'm hoping eventually I do, and if I do, we're going to do a follow-up episode about Joanne Gladys Gar, and hopefully we'll have the opportunity to talk to somebody who knows a little bit more about the case because, you know, this is, again, it's more than 40 years old, and you're not going to see it on the news. And this is exactly the kind of stuff that, you know, a humble podcaster sitting, uh, you know, up in the attic at, I guess it's midnight, wants to try to help out with. I think that you all take this stuff very seriously, as I do. And it's my hope that if we can, you know, raise awareness for all these cold cases we cover, that we can do just a tiny part to help kind of keep it in the, in the collective consciousness. Thank you for listening to this episode of True Crime Review. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at True Crime Review. You can find us on Reddit at r slash True Crime Review. And you can find us on Twitter at True Crime R-E-V. Go to truecrimereview.net slash subscribe to subscribe on whatever your favorite podcast platform or player is and get all of our new episodes as soon as they're released. Please, again, also leave a review in iTunes or wherever you listen to the podcast because those really do help us get more exposure. And our mission here is to do just that and to get these stories out. 
Our theme music is called Our Planet is Lost by Entropy Audio. And you can find more at entropyaudio.com. Our background music is Ophelia's Dream by Ben Sound. And you can find more at Ben Sound. This is your host, signing off of this episode of True Crime Review. Until next time, remember, family deserve truth, and victims deserve